So we have some school districts across this region, across the whole state, that they look at the different disability categories and how we identify kids for disability. And then we look at that, and then we look at different ethnic groups. So there's seven groups of ethnicity that, that we qualify. So if a school district has a lot of kids identified in one of the categories, so like we have kids that have intellectual disabilities, like MMD and FMD kids, we've had a lot of those kids over identified based on race. So predominantly in our region, you know, race, we only have one or two race and we don't have enough of a population to compare to ourselves. So we get compared to the state rate. And that's why our, our uh, over identifying kids. So like in, in our region, we have kids that are over identified, white kids that are over identified with intellectual disabilities and white kids that are over identified with specific learning disabilities. <clears throat> and so this is important. We think about how we, we think about referral and document that because right now, we're probably going to see especially ed teachers a lot of referrals because we have kids who um, you know have lost a lot of time in terms of you know uh, skills and strategies and classroom and so the thing about it is is we have to know as special ed teachers that we can't you know a lack of um, a lack of instruction can't be a reason that we refer kids and so that's why it's so important right now that we really focus on referrals and we make sure we do a good job of that like I said, some of you all I know very specifically, your districts have a real good referral system, but we also have to think about that process because you guys are end up being the ones that go back and help teachers, the regular ed teachers. I bet you all think about that. Do you all, are you all the ones that kind of help regular ed teachers with that referral, right? And so um, that's why we had this session, just to make it more um, helpful for you to find resources and then that way you guys can go back and help other teachers because we don't want to over identify because then that puts us in a whole nother issue at the district level. So we just wanna make sure that we identify kids correctly, the right way, the first time, and we make good choices about that. And then the um, other thing is that we have to make sure that we've provided appropriate instruction and intervention before they're referred for special ed. And that's where we lose it at sometimes. We can do, we get to kind of tier two interventions, but we, sometimes we don't make it to tier three. And so if we think about tiers of intervention, we want kids to get those supports at tier two. Uh, and then we sometimes don't make it to tier three, but that's our kids that we test. Uh, but if we think about that, we think about, you know, we don't wanna, we want to make sure that we are getting tier two supports and tier three level supports for kids. So those kids that we test and they don't qualify, rather than just going back in the general ed setting, we have have a good solid system in that process that we send them back to tier three. And so, you know, tier one is what happens in the regular classroom setting. Tier two happens in addition to the regular classroom setting and tier three happens in addition to tier one and tier two. So let's say if you have a child that's having trouble in reading and we put them in tier two and they're going through um, a, a multi-sensory reading program or a structured literacy program, for example, and that's their tier two. And tier two happens three days a week. Um, then we see that the kid's still not making a rate of progress, then we have to increase that. So we, all, we still do the two or three days a week of intervention with literacy, and then we add on some more days. So we decrease the size of the group, and we increase the frequency and the duration of how long we do interventions. So you see, that's kind of how it's so important that we understand that piece before they get referred to special ed. Now they can be in that referral process or their parent referral and they're, they're concurrently going through that referral process and, and receiving interventions too. But it helps us to know. So that's where we get to the part about how important that referral is for the, uh, the evaluation. So here is the, the Kentucky administrative regulations around what we're supposed to do in a school district around the requirements. So this is around the special ed law. So this comes straight from uh, Kentucky administrative rates with the law around special ed referrals. And so this is in that section here. And we say that we have to have a referral system that explains how referrals from district or non-district sources will be accepted. So we have to have a process for that. Um, that we has to be in a way that we prevent inappropriate or over-identification. And we have to ensure that as part of that, that process that they are receiving appropriate, relevant research-based intervention services and that we database documentation of the repeated assessments of achievement. So not only do we have to offer a system, but we have to capture that documentation. And that is a problem too, when you start looking at referrals. So 
when we go through the record review process and we're looking at initial placement for a child and we're looking at that referral documentation, that's, that's gotta be a good solid piece of information. And what we're having trouble is right here, this part right here, it's the research-based instruction and intervention strategies. Sometimes teachers don't know where to get those intervention strategies and they're making, we make mistakes on using activities like in teacher pay teacher, or we make uh, on Pinterest activities, right? And we're using those, but those are not really research-based intervention strategies. So as special ed teachers, you know, a referral and that, pre that intervention model, our role, but it is important for us because if they're gonna be referring them to, for, to be tested in special ed, we have to have that data. So the law requires that we have to have that documentation. And so we have to, we can't just say we did, uh, you know, small group instruction and that's our tier two or tier, but how did you use that small group instruction and how are you using instructional changes and how you document it? It's really about how you put it on paper and you document it. Cause you know, like you'll be working with a kid and let's say summarizing is, they're having trouble comprehending and you're working with them on summarizing and you're teaching them uh, a summarization. So you're doing like a beginning, middle and end of a story. And you're trying to work through that beginning, middle and end of a story and you're teaching them how to do that, right? And you create some graphic organizers and you've done some things with those kids and every week you do a little check on their progress, right? We do a little progress monitor check. We see how they're doing along the way. And we get to two or three weeks and we've got two or three data points and we don't see any difference or they're going down, they're decreasing. That's when we have to make an instructional change. And that's how we have to, we have to figure out how to document that. And so that's part of that referral process too, is saying, you know, have we done more than one thing? What are we doing? And is it evidence-based practices? And if it's not, then it, we really not are providing them the, the right academic interventions. So I'm just gonna stop right there. Anybody got any thoughts about that? So I, I think we talked about it the other day when we were at the high school, just like providing those teachers, like this is a good tier one strategy for this referral. This is a good tier two if they're having this, if you're suspecting this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think providing our, providing us so that we can provide our regular ed teachers yeah. with some of those strategies. Mm -hmm. um, would be very beneficial. I think so too. And we'll take a look because we've created some tools and resources yeah. to share with you guys to use for that. I and hopefully had a teacher recently come to me and say, what can I do for this? Right. Yeah. Right. I'm like, well, let me look into yeah. it because I don't really have, mm -hmm. and this right. is my first year with DD. So it's, right. it's new to me too. So yeah. I'm like, well, let me try yeah. to figure this out and talk to somebody else and get yeah. back with you. Yeah. So I feel like if we had that, that could be, those resources. Yeah. yeah. yeah do this for a tier one do this mm -hmm. for a tier so we'll do that we'll, before i'll make sure we have time to share with you guys the child find tool on, and i'll put it on the screen and we'll do that because that's exactly what we're talking about that's what we know that teachers need that support you guys need that support from at, at, at the regional level to take back to your school and your mm -hmm. district to say okay here's a good strategy because they look teachers look to you all for the strategies and this will help you all help them so we that's kind of how we understand that process to be is that we all have to help each other to get sure, make sure we're doing a good job with the interventions. Uh, now, right here, this if a child's not made adequate progress after an appropriate period of time, we we start we make a referral for an evaluation. So part of that is we have to, you know, as a districts, we look at that what's an appropriate amount of time and how do we look at those data points. And we generally kind of have a rule of thumb, you know, that we have five or six data points for and we look at, but there's a little bit of variation across different school districts. Um, so We'll go ahead. But so we know the biggest thing on response to intervention is that we have to go ahead and find those kids who are at risk of failure. So we have a child find obligation. You know, you all probably heard about child find. And we have an obligation as a school district to try to find those students that have a disability and get the supports that they need. We also have this obligation that we need to monitor that student progress. We, we that's I think, is one of the biggest areas that we have trouble with and the research-based interventions. So those are two big pieces. But then we have to know when is it appropriate to make a change instructionally or change your intervention. And that way we're correctly identifying those kids because that's what's happened to us. And we're over identifying kids and we don't want that to happen because we want kids to be set up for success, right? We want them to get the interventions they need. And because we have some 
programs that have a lot of kids in DD, and those DD kids are going straight on into special ed. If we do a really good job with DD, we shouldn't have as many kids going into special ed, right? We shouldn't have as many qualifying because we've given them the interventions they need. That sets them up for success, right? That helps kids move from tier two to tier three and, and get all the supports that they need. And, and they may be in tier three for a little bit and then move into tier two or right and back and forth, but that's okay. That's the way the real system should work around interventions. It should be fluid and they can get those tiers of intervention as they need them because there may be gaps in concepts that they miss. Uh, it's particularly, you know, when we've had virtual instruction and then back in classroom instruction. So they're gonna have maybe have some gaps, especially our kids that are kind of are behind anyway. Uh, so that kind of helps us. That's really the whole intention of this whole, this process. Um, the thing about it is, is we have, you know, we have the opportunity with a good solid uh, program to help kids not to fail, but to have the right interventions. And, um, and then we're, like I said, we get the kids that we really need in special ed. It's because, you know, if you get lots and lots of kids, you can't serve them as well as you can, you know, the, the kids that need it the most. So um, anyway, and we do a good job with, intervent with identification. And then we can start thinking about, you know, how we're screening. So we kind of start thinking about getting the right academic interventions for kids. And then uh, we get the kids, the right kids, the right supports that they need. And we start through that. And then we talk about screenings and how we move to specific interventions for those kids. So that's how we get to that, you know, that IEP or that personalized or that specially designed instruction is really kind of through that process. Um, so part of that is that we have to think about, there's lots of multi pieces that work in that system. And one of the things is before we start into those interventions and we start working with that, that referral, we, we have to start back on this first part of this and think about how, how often are we going to collect data, right? So you might have to go back and help teachers. So let's say they're doing reading interventions. How often do they need to collect that data, right? Because we don't want to wait two or three weeks since collect data. Is it weekly? But if you go ahead and set that up and that teacher sets that up, they know what to do on those, you know, those weekly data points or twice a week they're doing that. Uh, you wanted to see what process are you going to use to chart or graph the data, right? Because you, you don't want to try to go back and do it after you've done interventions. You want to set it up front and say, okay, these are the things we're going to use. It can be a checklist. It can be, you know, if we're using a, 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 a frayer uh, or sight words, right? If we're using a dosh sight word list and we have sight words, then that's our list, right? That's what we're going to use. We're going to use sight words. And every week we're going to check how many they can get, right? We can write a number. We can come up with a percentage. But we know that right up front that sight words is an issue for them. Or we know that constant vowel constant word problem patterns are trouble for them. So we're going to teach them uh, letters and sounds. And we're teaching them blending. And then we're going to assess them. But we already know ahead of time. But in a referral process, sometimes we have to go back. We try to think backwards rather than think about all this stuff going forward. And this would help us do a much better job if we started off from the beginning. Like if I know on Tuesday and Thursday that I've got a little chastity uh, at from 2 to 2.30, and this is what I'm doing with chastity, and every Tuesday and Thursday I'm documenting what I, what I taught her, and I write down the date, and I see what her score is. Well, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to know how well Chastity's doing. And I already have it thought through. I don't have to go back and try to hustle around and try to find my interventions or try to, to, to come up with the, uh, what those are because I already know what those are. I've already thought it through. I already have my plan. You also have to think about, you know, your district generally will decide kind of how many data points you have to have or whatever. But you got to know how many data points are you going to do. You're going to have to have six that's gently like kind of that's like the rule of thumb. So if I've got six data points after six, I need to look, right? Because I'm that could be three weeks, however long it could be. But you don't want to wait six weeks or the nine weeks and then just have a couple of data points and then you spent that whole time without giving them the supports that you know changing the instruction. And then we have to think about how we're going to monitor the progress of all kids, and then how are we going to monitor the progress of those kids who uh, we're providing interventions. And then we have to decide kind of some rules and we call that decision-making rules, but kind of what is that, at what point do we know it's time to make a decision? Is it three weeks after six data points, it's time to come together and make a decision? You know, we might do that in PLCs or we might do that in, you know, our RTI blocks or something like that. But if we know that ahead of time, 
everybody's real clear on it and everybody knows what those interventions are. So you don't have to have, this, you don't have, to have the same amount of bad points <clears throat> and weeks of intervention every time, do you? You don't. But you do have to have a certain amount, right? Yeah, well, like, like your district may say you have to have six data points, right? right? Six but, data points in each tier or six data points? Also. All right. All right. See, right. Different, different districts set them. Different. Right. Different districts set those at different rates. So you kind of have to go by your district RTI policy or right. MTSS policy because those are in policy and procedure. So you'd want to know kind of what that is. Um, so if you get into tier three, would it be a smaller amount of data if you're already in tier three and you're seeing? Usually. So that it well, be less time. Well, you or, well actually, maybe four to five and tier two, and then. Three or four in tier three, and then right. move along to referral. Because you're you're going to look at so if you've done six weeks of RTI data and you've collected data for six data points, that might just be three weeks, right? That's when you have to make an instructional change. You're not going to know. That's not enough data points to know if your instructional change. You're going to have to do some more data points to see if that instructional change actually impacted right. kids. Yeah. And so it depends on what you're doing interventions in, and if you're in tier two. You may only meet with them two times a week, but if they're in tier three, you may have them five times a week. So you're going to have more frequent assessments, more frequent data points. Okay. So right, so it depends, and it really goes back to that kind of same thing. Whatever the what you're working on with that kid, the intensity of that data. So you're going to have some tier two data points if they're in tier three. You're going to have what they're doing in the classroom setting. You're going to have some that tier two data points, and you're going to have tier three, right? But it gives you a real clear picture of where that kid's performing at. So if we're um... I'm sorry. No, it's good. High school, but um, if we are moving a kid through these tiers, and let's say they're kindergarten, and you know we're moving them through these tiers, and they've made it to tier three, we are still doing everything in tier two. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. We still do tier two, yes. and we add something else. Yes. As a tier three. And tier yes. Three. So, so tier we collect data on both. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Because when they get to tier three, what you do is you increase the duration, the frequency, or you decrease the group size, right? Oh. You move, like say you're doing two tier, tier two and you may be using um, a, a vocabulary strategy or something, you're using a graphic organizer and you're working with those kids on that, uh, but that the kids are not making progress, you have to do something in addition to that. You never take away tier two, you add tier yeah. three, but you may have five kids in your small group, but when you go to tier three, you may have one or two kids. So your group size decreases, the intensity of the intervention increases, and then um, the frequency. Could I do the same strategy? strategy? It could be. You can use the same strategy. Just maybe more but you're going to have more frequent. A smaller group. Yes. Yeah. Because some of those strategies you're going to use would work at tier two and work at tier three. It's just that, again, when you look at tier two, you can't stop doing what you were doing in tier two. So if they were going twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, to the intervention teacher, you're going to have core one happening, you're going to have core the tier two happening, and then you're going to add on something for tier three, right? So you're still going to be adding those on because that's the whole intention of that is we move them all the way up to tier three, and then we see how they're doing because they need more intensive intervention. And you're going to see how they're doing along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Again, that's where we have the trouble. We kind of lose a little bit of that when we move from tiers. It kind of impacts... Um, but we don't ever stop doing what we're doing in tier one and tier two because tier three is an addition. To that. And that's a hard thing for people to kind of get the, uh, get a handle on. So, um, but we still collect the data because either at tier three, you're doing it five times a week for 20 minutes or you're doing it tier two for two days a week and, and you're doing three days or four days a week for tier three, right? So you're still collecting data. You're still going to see what is it, we're what, what intervention am I using here and how is that working? Right, because it depends on what you're working on too. Um, you know, like I said, content areas are a little bit of difference with the content areas and math might look a little different than reading. But like, you know, you might have um, tier one to be your core instruction. So that's what you're learning in your class and you all, Reading Street, that's what they're doing with their, with their basal program or um, Wit and Wisdom or whatever it is program that we're using. And then um, that might be foundations, that might be phonics program, whatever. So that's your core instruction. That's what everybody gets. Yeah. And then on tier two, that's what we're doing in addition to what they're getting with everybody. So you might still be doing small group in tier one, right? When you do guided reading, well, guided reading can be tier one, but you can also use guided reading for tier two interventions. But it's in addition, right? You might decrease the group size. Instead of having everybody in the class in a group, you may have, you may pull three kids out to do tier two. And then when you get to one or two kids, then you do, um, 
that would be your tier three. Mm -hmm. So that kind of helps with that. Uh huh. And you got to explain that. That's right. You got to collect data on it, and you got to figure out how you're going to collect data, and then you're going to explain that in your analysis. That's the same way when we progress monitor. It's yeah. the same way. We're collecting our data in special ed, and then we're putting those data points on there, and then we're having an explanation of uh, analyzing why we think we got what we got. Right? Yeah. Either so we see. The, it's the same exact our thing. Our is basically the same as progress. It's it like really our is. Progress monitor, yeah. but on a different. Right. So, right. The, some districts that that process looks different at that uh, as in the referral process, but that should still be the same kind of. It's the same thing we're doing interventions, right? Our specially designed instruction is real similar. Those strategies, they're all evidence based, high impact instructional strategies for kids. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It's just those kids before we get them right, referred. Right. And if we do a good job before we get them in referral, then we hope to get them. We don't want them to place or be right. identified if they don't really have a disability. And that's when you know if the kids really have a disability or not, right? Because you've given those solid interventions. And if you say two days a week, you need to do two days a week, right? You, you won't just write down that I'm giving them graphic organizers. But how? When, what's the frequency of that? Two days a week, you're using... Uh, sentence starters if they're having trouble in writing and you're giving them a writing prompt or you're and then you give them a timed writing that's your assessment whatever you're doing you've got to say I'm, this the frequency I'm doing that and then how I'm going to collect the data so I'm going to give them um, I'm going to say twice a week I'm going to give them a writing prompt but I'm, going to, but I'm going to have to do some instruction along the way too right I'm going to have to teach them how to write do a writing prompt um, or I might be teaching some skills in that. But whatever it is, you got to say, this is how we're going to give the interventions. Then you provide the interventions, just like you said you're going to, and then you check the back. So this one, I gave you all that multi, the referral for multidisciplinary evaluation. So this is just a copy. Now, what I want you to look at is on the pages of this referral, all this has to be completed. And you'll see the notes down here. It says all areas in the demographic box must be completed. If, if not, and the referral section and the record review document. So when somebody comes and does a, a record review for your folder, if it's an initial placement, mm -hmm. if that's not all full, then you get a no on the record review. So that's important to know, right? It's important that we know that we get a no on the record review. Well, you know what happens if you get a no on the record review? It's a non-compliant, right? So those are important things to know. Everything that, yeah, all that part has to be filled out. Well, this is in your infinite canvas. You've got one in an infinite canvas. So this is your referral. I just gave you all this paper copy. I'll show you in a minute. It's in the, uh, you all do your referrals in your district uh, in infinite canvas, don't you? You fill out the referral not, document or do y'all do a paper I copy? Don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. This is just the one from the Department of Education. I've seen, I've seen this, but yeah. we don't. Do you all have a little different one and you'll use your district one. When we do regional trends like that, we kind of just use a general so one. Just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. It just make sure you have the demographic part filled out. Yeah. Because it might look a little different. Yeah, I've seen this, but we yeah. don't use it. Yeah, and you might have, yeah, you all have a little different one. Every district does things just a little bit different, and they've worked on their form. Like, you all have a different process in your district than many other districts do. <laughs> so, that you all, like, yeah, every district has different processes that, to, that they do. So, you can see the biggest thing is if there's an area of concern, we have got to have had interventions in that area. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can't just we can't just do academic interventions and reading and math, and then and then we test a kid and they qualify right. We've not done academic intervention. We're not done provided interventions for them. Or let's say we have a kid. If you look at that next section, um, this one is about the cognitive function. If we're looking at cognitive functioning for kids, what are areas that we're looking for? Right, because we need to be we need to know what those areas are that we're looking for. And again, this might be just a general document. The yours might look a little different in your district, but um we just if we if we're going to be providing interventions we have to know what the area is to provide interventions that's why it's really important on that same thing for academic performance so we look at those right we're looking at the academic performance those are those areas right if we're looking if we think a kid's going to have a specific learning disability those are the areas that we're going to be working in, mm -hmm. right? We're going to be looking at their uh, or a written expression. We're going to be looking at written comprehension. We're going to be looking at basic reading skills. We're going to be looking at fluency. But if we're doing interventions in those areas, we have to document that. So you have to document those interventions in those areas. I'll stop right there. Anybody got any questions? So for this one, I think we're going to do a different. It is fine. 
Right, but right. the, 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 the yeah, yours might look a little different. Right. But the gist of it is that it, if but you can like, click, like you can do multiple ones. You on can just one thing yeah. instead of doing. Yeah, you don't have to have a different one for every one of them, right? You, okay. Yeah, unless you all have a specific way you right. do it in your district. Like I said, sometimes districts have a little bit of variation, but right. yeah, you could be working on a couple of different things because you may be working on reading fluency, reading comprehension, and basic reading and skills. I don't, yeah, right. If you're, this depends yeah. on where you're working at with, with students. Right. You know, like Chastity talked this morning, you know, sometimes you might be working on comprehension and fluency with kids. They may have some two or three areas that they are that you're working on um and again this is before you know those are the areas you're working on with them before we accepted a referral or went through that referral process so you're going to have documentation on all those so okay uh, this is on a parent referral how does you still once the parent refers that's when you start tier one or have you already kind of started that i'm always tier one's always you like started but you discuss it and then the parent says, oh, I would like to refer, or can they just come up and be like, hey, I want to refer my kid, and then that's when you start. Well, the team will come together and look at the data, and the parent says, um, you know, we want to make a referral, but you'll come together as a team, and you'll start looking at the data, and you'll have, you'll make a decision, is that, do we have enough evidence to say that we want to make a referral? Okay. Uh, and that's okay, you can, and the parent can make a referral, and you can, and, and we see that there's a targeted area and we do interventions during that time when we're testing. So we can accept that referral. We might have enough, we may look at their tier one and tier two and say, oh yeah, because you know, we're doing tier two maybe before we ever make a referral. Right. We could say, yeah, there's an evidence that we think that maybe something's going on with this kid. Or, and so we start doing interventions while we test them and that, you know, we can do it okay. that way. Yep. Um, so let me just skip on over. The same thing for social competence. You know, we have those kids, that uh, you know, that that have area of social right that could be our kids that have adaptive issues that are like uh, with uh, MMD or FMD but what is it what is it that maybe we're working on with kids because we kind of have to be able to know what we've been working on that helps us decide how we're going to evaluate kids right we have to know what they what the issue is so if we think a kid has um, trouble with um, maybe with um, you know, Interacting with peers, do we think that might be a kid has an emotional behavior disorder? Or we, those will give us clues about what we're working with kids on in order to make decisions about the evaluation planning form. And what do we know has worked for that kid so far? And then what do we need to do different? Uh, the same thing for communication. You know, if we're working on communication, that also is the same. We look at communication for kids that are like um, that. Or FMD is communication an issue for children with autism. Is communication something we need to be working on interventions for? So, it, you know, is it speech? So there are lots of things if we know and understand the disability categories and kind of what kids need that helps us make a good, solid decision about what we need to test and we get the placement right. But then the other thing, you know, we're, we have to look at lots of pieces of data when we look at how students are performing. So we always talk about that triangulation of data. And um, so like right here, you know, we're looking at, we gotta look at the universal screeners. What screeners are you all using? How do you know what kids? Yeah, you might be for dance or kindergarten. I have a question about the DDI ones. Okay. Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. But then it's like right now we're doing kindergarten registration all week mm -hmm. this week. So we're doing video, filming. So I mean, mm -hmm. But I some questions about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and that's right. Uh, the dance and I ready. Yep. So you're using some I ready. I've never okay. heard of that one. I ready. I ready um, is one that we called something else a little bit before, but you know I ready is one that they use in a lot of districts. Well, it's, it's like a map. It. I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's a like little this. older one. I think it. So it's like a map. So. What's the so that person that shared that with us, what grade did you all use? I read transcend transcend data, one. right? You got some transcend yeah. data, yeah. yeah, right. So every district's got a little bit of different kind of screening data and how you decide. If you think about those universal screen screeners, you're probably using map. Mm -hmm. Does everybody use map? Yeah. yeah, right. So map is going to be one of your universal screeners. Um, what else do you all use? Some people use star, dibbles. Mm -hmm. They use it school wide for all kids. Okay, right. I ready is one that some of the districts chose. Okay. You remember we used to do another one. I forgot what it's called. Like uh, think, link, 
maybe or something. So it's already equivalent to the It's kind of like a map okay. assessment. It's like that, yeah. Um, so those might be what your district uses. And that's kind of how we screen kids to see where they're performing at. And that's where we, that's how we have to kind of start. So that's how this whole process starts is, you know, what are we looking at our district universal screener? Well, it might be um, the Brigantz for kids coming into kindergarten. That might be one of our tools. We also have to look at what other things that we have. So how are they performing on the map data? So you're gonna look at that. And right here, it says, you know, we, we'd wanna make sure that we've looked at that data. So we see how kids are performing. And I'll tell you something that happened the other day. We were in a school district and we were looking at benchmark data for map and benchmark was not proficient. There was a difference. So even if kid was benchmarked, that didn't mean they were proficient. When you look at those cut scores on math, uh, that didn't mean that they were proficient because we think that, right? Because you think that the if they met benchmark, they're good to go, but they, they're not necessarily at proficient. So if you're looking at proficiency and how kids are doing, you have to look at those scores too. What else do you all use for the screeners? Anything else y'all can think of in your district? So anybody else? Okay. Yeah, we can use dibbles. Yeah, we can use, yeah, because you, mm -hmm. yeah. you can check oral reading fluency. There's mm -hmm. some things that you might use with dibbles. So every school have a little bit of variation on it, and then districts will have a little bit of variation. Um, but now we have to start getting to this part about right here. We um, we look at that target area. We've got to know kind of what we're doing interventions in, and then we have to be able to provide strategies and interventions in that area. And then we have to talk about when we start, what, when the end date is, and then on the target area. What's the impact? We need to know the scores, right? We need to know what the scores are. So let's use an example. Um, well, let's say that we have a kid in fifth grade and they're reading 105 words a minute. And really at, an eighth, at the fifth grade, they need to be reading 195 words a minute, right? So when we do our baseline for, for them, they have 105 words per minute. So what are we going to work on? We're going to work on fluency, right? So what is it we might use? So we're going to have to find out what a research-based strategy is to use for fluency, right? Well, it may be the use of words and phrases. It may be, um, what else, Chastity, can you think of something for fluency that we do? Um, we do um, short, I know we use phrases. We do repetition and practice. There's lots of different things that we can do with fluency. Could sight words work with fluency? You could do sight words because so, you could do some yeah. type of strategies. Yeah, words. right. Um, you could use, so it just depends on kind of where the kid's at and what they need because they may be ready for words and phrases or they may just be working on, on words. Um, but you have to decide that, what that strategy and intervention is, and you have to look at what date you started. So let's say you go back tomorrow. Today's what? April the 14th. So you go back tomorrow and you've looked at kids' performance and your and kids are not where they need to be. Their fluency is below level, their comprehension is below level, whatever it is. But we have to use that comprehension or that fluency score, that baseline score, and then we have to provide them with interventions. So it has to match. That's the important thing is that it has to match. I just, I think, how do we know that our intervention is the correct intervention? Right, or the research, research base. Yes. How so do you know that, that it's acceptable? Saying, like, right, right. Yeah. Because oh, you think oh, that's that's a great idea. Let's yeah. use that. But then, what if it's not research based? Right, and that's what you have to kind of do. So you kind of got to get a little uh, practice on that. Right. I'm going to let you all look at something. I'm going to minimize this screen and bring up another screen, and I'm going to show you all something. So we come up with uh, some inter some strategies or interventions that we use in this tool. We call uh, it's a child find tool. So this one's one that you all can have access to. It's one we created your KVEC, but you can have access to this one and share with your regular ed teachers because they this will help them understand interventions. But what you wanna do is you're gonna look for interventions that say these are evidence-based. Right here, let's say, let's look, go through this, this one right here. So this is an example. So, and I'm gonna let y'all think of one in just a second, but let's say that we have a child that's having trouble with recognizing or producing rhymes, right? They, don't, they can't do rhyming words. So what do we do? So what do we do? So we look for some how we develop phonological skills, right? That's an intervention. Well, these are links to evidence-based interventions, okay. right? Uh, and how do we show the evidence? We have our data collection, right? So we might have, uh, if we're looking at uh, producing rhyming words, then we might have a series of rhyming words, like five sets of rhyming words, and we see kids can do that. 
right? If they can do it or if they can't do it. So we have five. And the first time they have three, and the second time they get three, and the next time they get two, and the next time they get one, right? And we're teaching them, um, we're using a strategy for clapping that rhyme words or something like that. So we're using that strategy. Now, if they are not getting it by using that intervention, then it, we would need to change that intervention, right? But we can choose strategies like this from uh, the, our supports. But, but then we have evidence, right? We have the data collection and we have the evidence. So like this tool will give you this, the um, awareness skills test or it'll give you a checklist, but you know then whatever the intervention is, then you can provide the data collection tool to go along with it. So, so that is basically a link to some intervention. It is, that are evidence-based. And you don't have to just use these, but you have to do a little work around it uh, and helping teachers. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're making mistakes around teacher pay teacher or like Pinterest interventions that we think are good. But if they don't have the data behind them to, to say they're evidence-based, we really are not getting what we need to get right. to. And not necessarily don't use them in a the classroom, but don't use them for the referral process, right? Right, well, you're right. you can right. use some different yeah, intervention like strategies. Good, but but yeah. if you want to think about what intervention strategies are gonna get the most effect for kids, you want to choose those ones that have the greatest impact. There's a ton of research behind saying this is the one, to, you know, this one is effective. If you use it right and you use it in the classroom with kids, it's going to work. That's what we want. That's why we want to do it. So let me let y'all just think a minute. Think about a kid that you all have on your caseload right now. Just pick a kid. And we're, we're going to talk through, uh, I'm going to give you all some examples, and then I'm going to let you all kind of think about how you all would do interventions for them. And we'll go through one of these examples. So um, each one of you just write down a note thinking about a kid who has either uh, something in reading they're working on, right? One of those areas in reading, is it phonics? Is it phonemic awareness? Is it vocabulary? Is it fluency or comprehension? So everybody just write down that kid on your paper. Just think about a kid that you have on your caseload that you'd like some support around thinking through an intervention. So just pick an area. And we'll stick with reading right now if y'all want to. We'll stick with reading and do a couple of examples. So we literally just put like reading. Yeah. So what area? So we're going to try to think about that. Is it going to be around their basic reading? Is that kind of, do they know their letters and sounds? Right now, you're saying mine's, mine's just letters and sounds. Mm -hmm. Really, they're there. So, so maybe on basic reading, you're going to work on letters and sounds. Okay. So do I put that all in the targeted area, basic yeah. reading, letters, sounds, or do mm -hmm. I just put reading? You can do that. You can just put reading, but now you can just make your note for you. Just yeah. put it down below it, just okay. uh, letters and sounds. Okay. And our target area wouldn't change, even though our intervention is That's right. Our target area might not change because it's still, we're, we're, we're concerned about their comprehension or their fluency or their vocabulary. So is this even start date, end date? So this would be like tier one, mm -hmm. then start date, end date, mm -hmm. or... Do we put, yeah, you would start date. Where do you put like their percentage? And stuff? Well, like I said, you all have a little bit different, but I would put the impact on target area. I would put oh, that percentage. Put percentage. I would, for this particular one, yeah. So you don't actually, do you have to, where's your analysis go? Well, yeah, we'll have that another spot. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So um, right now we're just talking about how we support teachers to get through the strategies and find the resources that they might need. You can find things like high yield instructional strategies, right? Marzano has high yield instructional strategies. Those are uh, all instructional strategies that are evidence based. So it would be more than just a vague strategy, but we're just going to say, um, you know, it might be identifying similarities and differences, or I'm using a graphic organizer and then how, how they're going to use that. Or I want to use constant about constant pattern words and I'm going to use one of these strategies, right? So, so, so yeah, use. so my area was CDC blended. Okay. Okay. So your area, is, yours is going to be on basic reading. What about yours? Basic reading. Anybody have anybody else do basic reading? Anybody else have Let's basic see. reading or comprehension? Okay. So yours will be basic reading. What about yours? Basic reading. You know, I even tried to Google it. You know, you've got the three dots, and uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. but how do you know that that is, it is research? Okay, so that's what we're going to go I back think to. It's a great strategy in the classroom, right? But how? What's the evidence based behind? Well, you're going to have to do a little research on that. You're going to have right. to look to so see. We literally, to to do this, we have to 
research it ourselves to make well, sure that it's research. But I go to places <laughs> like Marzano's High Yield Instructional Strategies. And I so they put all those, Or I'd put, look at John Hattie's effect size. I would go to somewhere that I knew that yeah, they'd done the research yeah, on that. I don't know to go to those. Okay, so that's no, a good thing to good. understand in the process. Says, yeah, yeah, do this. Yeah. These are some good so, sites. Yes. Okay. So she's using Re ReadWorks as her resource, right? So she's using ReadWorks.org uh, to get her reading passages. So that's what she'll use for the progress monitor, and that'll be where she gets her passages from. So what strategy might we use for comprehension? Right. So that's where we start thinking about the strategies. And so we'll go through it. We'll look at that one too. So let's look at the basic reading. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, you want to work on constant vowel consonants. That's when we think about reading, we go to this piece here around phonics, right? Because that's phonics, right? We're looking at letters and sounds. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's one uh, here that we want to focus on. Are we having trouble with kids uh, being able to pronounce one-to-one -one letter sounds? Like, do they know all 26 letters all right. and 44 sounds? Okay, if they don't, then that might be where we start at working on letters and sounds. Wow. All right, so let's see what we're going to find. Let's see if we can find some around, you know, using um, multisyllabic words or blending, or is it, what do we, can we find around constant vowel constant patterns? So I might go and look at then one of those resources, then I would use that one as the intervention, right? I'm going to choose an intervention strategy for that, and then I'm going to collect data on it. So part of that process is how do we learn to choose and select evidence-based practices? And so I'm going to do, I might look at this one. Let's see. I might look at uh, here, explicit instruction and syllabication. Let's just say I picked this one, right? So I'm teaching syllables. So I'm teaching individual sounds and syllables. Then I go to uh, an evidence-based source, and then I get the resources that I need to be able to teach syllables. Right, so I'll get some strategies, and you got to look to see. Right, there's some uh, the evidence around that, so you could look to see. So these we've already vetted, and we've got the so evidence we behind them. We know what these are, right? But I would choose this, right? This all comes from you know some basis on this Wilson Reading or Gillingham program, some of those initiatives. So we kind of know the research behind those. Right. So we go to things that we know work. Like, you know, structured literacy. Many of our districts are trained in structured literacy. That's an evidence-based practice. So if you use structured literacy or you use Orton-Gillingham or you use one of those things for your tiered interventions, you know that those are evidence-based practice. And most of your districts bought those, right? And they have those and they've got teachers trained in. Uh, but here would help me figure out syllables, right? I'd have to work on, um, you know, is it constant vowel constant patterns? Am I going to work on letter sounds? Right, but I would find that I would go to one of those places that I knew taught phonics, like a, a foundations program, or I would do a structured literacy. I would look for a phonics program, and that's how I'd start teaching kids a systematic way of teaching phonics. Okay, but anybody got another one we want to try? But anyway, so I would do that, and then I would find the resources for that, and then I would start providing those interventions. Right, you got to teach and them this some, is and it could be tier two, absolutely. You could do it in small group. Uh, and then you've the frequency or the duration, you could move this same strategy to tier three as long as you decrease the group size yeah, and, and increase the hour. Let's say we're in kindergarten, whatever our teachers are using in the classroom, whole group instruction should be a research. They should be. Method anyway. They should be. If we're using Reading Street or whatever we're using, that would be their core, right? Those should be. So if based. they brought that down into a small group, Mm -hmm. and gave them more than just whole group instruction mm -hmm. we could still just use that you could use pe yeah parts of that mm -hmm. you just want to the way you deliver it and more is a lot to, right smaller group you might break it down or chunk it right that would be okay it's just we, we have to just try to make sure that what we're doing we know is we know is effective but right. you could take pieces of that they've got level readers that you right. can use with that um, they've got vocabulary strategies you can use with any of those. It's really about just being able to pick the right strategy right. and then and, and make sure it's effective. So there's a few different places that you can find those things. Um, but anyway, so that's how you go about. It. So you you got to figure out what the skill that kids need is. Then you start you planning the interventions around that. So sometimes we do it backwards, right? Sometimes we do it backwards. Sometimes we we look at their test scores. And we start doing a bunch of interventions and then we back up to see kind of where they're at. And sometimes we never get to what the skill is that are missing. I had this example the other day. Kids were having trouble. There were sixth grade kids having trouble reading. And uh, they finally drilled down and used kind of a screener and figured out what, what they didn't have. 
they didn't know long and short vowel sounds. So they did some lessons on long and short vowel sounds and kids were reading. It was as simple as understanding what the skills because they couldn't take how long did it take for them to get there uh, it was a little bit i mean it took them a little while because they had to teach them the rules like you know like the the you know how to how to know when to use right. mommy e or you know uh when to use the long vowel sound or the close you know and they so they had to teach them the strategies to figuring out how to solve words and once the kids learn the strategy then they could you, like they teach them open and closed syllables, right? Or they teach them you know word patterns, and then they can solve that on their own. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Okay, who else had another one we want to do? Somebody else come up with one. Let's do the comprehension one. Okay, so this one, like I said, we've done the work around this one, but here is one around fluency. So if you have kids trouble with fluency, then here's some strategies and activities you can do. Um, here's one if they're having trouble with vocabulary. So it goes vocabulary is a big piece of comprehension. And then we have, um, here's comprehension. So you have a kid that's in uh, third, fourth grade and they're having trouble second grade. They're having trouble figuring out. They're having trouble comprehending text. So over here, we've got some of the problems. Can they, can they ask and answer questions? They can't use details in the text. They don't have, they have trouble summarizing. They have trouble. They don't know how to do main idea or central theme. Uh, they can't use this, any one of those strategies. And here's the, the big comprehension strategies, right? They're all listed right there. They can't use some of those strategies. That's what you teach them. That would be your evidence-based strategy for comprehension. You might teach them questioning or you might teach them visualization. So those become your evidence-based strategies. Um, but you can use something like this to help you diagnose the problem. Then you know what interventions to provide. And then you've got to be able to collect the data on them, and then you have to be able to progress monitor or have probes that match that. And so I kind of got a little bit off track on the progress monitoring, but uh, I mean, on the referral process. But so it, it's the same thing for math. We, you can do the same kind of thing for math because, you know, when we qualify kids, they're either math calculation or math, compu uh, math calculation or math fluency, right? No, right, math reasoning. And so if we're working on that and we're looking at what kids need in those areas, then we want to do math interventions the same way. We do it the exact same way. We try to figure out what the problem is that they're having. Is it regrouping? Is it aligning? Is it with base 10? Is it with fractions? It don't matter what grade they're in, but we have to start somewhere with our universal screeners and we kind of have to drill down to that skill. But imagine if we could drill down to that skill before kids ever are referred for special ed and got them the interventions they need, how many less kids we would have that would qualify for special aid because we got them the right interventions that they needed. So, but uh, like I said, this is not the be all end all, but it's certainly a tool that if you don't have a toolbox of your own, you could start with this one. Yeah. Because you help you diagnose what the problem is that they have. And then you can think about some resources. So like everyone's in this to our regular. Yeah, and, and they can, yeah. that would be very helpful. Yeah, they can use these. Yeah. Like if, for example, like right here, let's say you're having trouble um, figuring out text. You can click on an anticipation guide. So when we say we say we're using a graphic organizer, well, what graphic organizer are we using? Well, this one gives us a clue. It's an anticipation guide, right? So it tells us what it is and how we use it. If you don't have a toolbox full of tools already and you need some help kind of getting it figured out, this is a good place to go. Or you want to help your teachers and they might not know, it's a good place to go get resources. But it'll take you to tell you exactly how to do it. Here's your blank templates. This is what you might need to teach that, and that can be your progress monitoring. So if teachers are trying to figure out what to do to help kids, they can go to these links and get the same resources that you do. Because that's the hard part, I think, for, for our interventions. So, yeah. Basically, like classrooms. Yeah. Right. They depend on you, especially ed teachers, to have those strategies. And sometimes we have to figure out how to get those, you know, support them with that. Well, let me just show you kind of what it looks like for math. And like I said, these are not certainly not the be all end all. It's just some things that we put together for resources here to help you all. So let's say I'll show you the, the interventions for math. And so it kind of guides you and helps you think through that process. Let me see. So here's one. Um, this is kind of, these are just the video on how to use it. But then this one talks about the tiered system of supports for high quality instruction. Mm -hmm. And that takes you to high quality core instruction. So those are resources to kind of help you understand what's good and what's not. Right. And then it tell, and then we go through the whole understanding of what it means, what tier one means. Mm -hmm. What does that look like a math? What does it look like a tier two? What does it look like a tier three? 
And then here's like math calculation. So we write, we would have kids that qualify in math calculation. We're right here. What's the area of concern? And so this is the documents laid out that same way. What they're having trouble with? Is it regrouping? Well, here's some ideas about helping them with regrouping. Whatever that skill is, is that their deficits, what's important that we, that we get. So we don't just say read and comprehension, but there, we have to drill down. Is it summarizing? Is it, is it main idea? Is it um, theme? Is it uh, find textual evidence? Is it, um, you know, is it text? But whatever it is that kids are, that they need to help on, and then you drill down to that, you know what interventions to teach. And that's, that gives you the exact skills that they need to be working on. And then you know how to go find that. So like right here's an example. Here's one. Um, if they don't have trouble, they have trouble with supervising or counting, or they can't count backwards. Well, here's some things. Here's some games and strategies that are evidence-based that you can play with those kids or use with those kids. This worked for your IEP kids, too. Mm -hmm. You take this right here and looked at what area they were having trouble with, and you wanted to do the Kathy Richardson games. They're evidence-based practices. They're research-based. She's published. Those are They have this, the research behind them saying these are effective strategies. Those so if you... Absolutely. Yeah. So you can take this one and use this right in your classroom. You figure out what the kids need, because that's what we do in special ed is progress monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. Before we, but you know, so the same, we're asking the same thing of regular ed when we do the MTSS or systems of interventions. But do you see how much different this would be before we had, if we got the right interventions for kids and the support for kids before they were referred? And look how much stronger your referral would be. If you knew that you tried these and you did these three days a week, and you collected it, and then you uh, you had that data telling exactly what that skill was, and then you had it, it, it were they at 40%, were they at 62%, then you know if you were right on, if you're on the task or not. Anyway, same thing. If they have trouble with place value, here's some things, here's math, here and math, this is using the manipulative. All the blues are links, but here tells you, this one has the effect size, so this comes from Hattie's work saying, the things that are most effective. It's already got the research behind it right here. It's quoted right in these links right here. So you'll know. If it's in here, it's evidence-based, right? There's a little bit of that work is gone when you use some of those resources like that. And then we connect you back to the, there's links back to the Kentucky Department of Education's MTSS program and tiers of intervention and supports around that too. So uh, we did get off a little bit off of the document referral, but this is important for you to know when you go into that referral process. So once you figure this out, you know, I might come over here and I want to help kids working on manipulatives. Um, here's, here's how I use manipulatives. So here is the instruction on using manipulatives. So let's say my kids are having trouble with place value. And then here's the manipulative. So I might give them a one tens and hundreds chart, right? So you print that off, you teach them what is the place value, and then you assess them. That gives you the data of what well, did they make that progress or not. You work three days a week for 20 minutes a day during MTSS in a small group and you see if, it, if it's working for them. And if it's not, you change the instruction, you pick another strategy, you use a different manipulative or you use a different strategy, you check along the way to see how they're doing. And then at the end, when you go to a referral meeting and you say, this is the data we've got, you know pretty well if that kid needs to be referred or not because you've got the data to substantiate what you're, why you think that. And then you know what to put in your evaluation plan as a special ed teacher, because you know what the areas are, right? You don't have to guess. You pretty well know what they need and what the supports they're going to need. It helps you make better decisions. We also have a referral checklist that we created here at KVEC, and it takes you through the whole referral piece. And I'll just click it and let you see what it looks like. Um, so everybody here can see this one. This helps you track it, right? You put the student's names, you're going to look at their absences, you're going to look at their discipline records, you're going to look at your tiered interventions. Right? What did you do? What's your reading spreader? What were your strategies? Do you have the data points? You're not going to check that off. You're, and when you get done as a special ed teacher, you're going to know that you have all the documentation to do a complete referral. And so this checklist, we just print them off. We give them to our school districts. They print them off, keep them with them. So if you've got four or five kids that are in that referral process, you can give this to the regular ed teacher and they can write down when, what, you know, they have, they know they have the information about what the strategies are, what the interventions were, do they have their data points? What screeners did they use? And then you get on over in here that helps you with knowing, you know, how did you document it? Did you give it your envision screening, right? Before you send them over to special ed, helps them use that. As the standard special education referral, that's the one that's an infinite campus and it kind of talks you through the data standards about how to go through and do that in infinite campus. 
and then it talks about that. And then here's an IRC checklist. So if you're doing a referral meeting and you need a checklist for an IRC meeting, like you wanna learn, you wanna make sure you don't miss anything, this one right here is a checklist for you to use also. And some of you that maybe have been doing that a while may not need it, but it's a good, helpful tool for anybody that, you know, is relatively new at it or wants to make sure you don't miss anything. It tells you what to bring, what you gotta do to get ready for the meeting, what to bring to the meeting, what forms you need, and then the whole process as you're accepting a referral. And that's very helpful to remember. It is, I said, you, you mentioned the new teachers, but I tell you, I had until I went the day I left the classroom, and I was in the classroom 20 years, I still had a checklist for every mm -hmm. meeting because just with you, even if you know it, just when you have all those meetings that pile up, you just don't want to forget anything mm -hmm. because we all know how important it is and how they tell me what to do if you forget something, how aggravating it would be to have to go back. But I mean, and I didn't have that at, at the time, and that would be so helpful because uh, just it just it helps. That's one less thing you have to think about too. Yeah. It's, it's right there for you, you know. So check, you know, yeah, check it off. Right. And right here, like this one right here, step four, review the referral. So you're gonna look at that referral. You're gonna have that referral. Does it have the sufficient information? 